Dear listeners, welcome to Faces of Digital Health, the podcast on how technologies are improving healthcare around the world. If you haven't followed blockchain development from its early beginnings, you might have struggled when searching for reliable sources about the topic. This was one of the many triggers for a new book on blockchain titled Blockchain in Healthcare Innovations that Empower Patients, Connect Professionals and Improve Care. In today's podcast episode, two of the editors, David Metcalf and Alex Kahana, explain the current state of blockchain in healthcare, the rising maturity of ideas and discussions, and why the mentioned book is a comprehensive guide for those hardly beginning to get acquainted with the blockchain and those who have been in the space for a while and perhaps wish to get updated on the latest developments. I am your host, Tiasha Zaitz, and if you're a regular listener of this podcast, you know that blockchain has been a topic of many episodes so far, from explaining how technology works, to unveiling what it will not solve, and more. Find the links to older episodes addressing these issues in the show notes. And a quick invitation before we start today's discussion... If you like the show, please leave a rating or a review in iTunes so other listeners interested in digital health will find it as well. Also, subscribe to the podcast so you will be notified about each new published episode. Among the upcoming themes are digital health infrastructure in Estonia, what progress is artificial intelligence bringing to aging research and more. Check the already published episodes as well. You can hear a recent interview with the CEO of Hymns Hal Wolf, get an insight into how music is used as a healing tool in the ICUs, learn about perseverance from a surviving pancreatic cancer patient, and more. Now back to today's show with David Metcalf and Alex Kahana. David is a researcher with more than 20 years of experience in the design and research of web-based and mobile technologies, converging to enable learning in healthcare. And Alex is a medical doctor, philosopher, currently working as an advisor at Crypto Oracle, a New York-based VC and strategic advisory. Check him out on Medium, where he regularly covers various latest topics surrounding blockchain developments in healthcare. Alex and David, my first warm-up question for you guys, since you've been in the blockchain space for a very long time by now, is um, do you have any of your data already on any blockchain? Uh, David, do you want to start? Yeah, so I'll start. Yeah, we we do. Um, you know, between some of the wallets and exchange and cold wallets, um, we have trusted the system. <laughs> so uh, both personally and also with some of our institutional data for the organizations that uh, my team, at least, has been involved with. David, you've been involved in uh, many pilot projects or also in, in the healthcare. Did you also participate there with any of your data? Yeah, we did. Um, we've had uh, a few projects, including uh, one of our earliest from really starting in 2013 and uh, getting some funding at the end of 2014 and uh, 2015 called Health Shares that was funded by our U.S. Uh, National Science Foundation. And uh, some of our health and wellness data from devices was actually presented in there as some of the, well, in that case, demonstration level data. But that was the system that was proven during that time frame too. Not necessarily an electronic health record, but more a personal wellness record from some of the wearables data. Alex, what about you? I am patient uh, 001 on a uh, platform that allows peer-to-peer -peer payments uh, to your doctor in the United States. And I uh, um, am diligently not Googling, but using Brave to access information uh, to the world. 
So the short answer is yes, and more and more as every day goes by. You two recently co-edited a book called Blockchain in Healthcare Innovations that empower patients, connected professionals, and improve care. The trigger to start thinking about this book was the awareness of the difficulty of finding credible, helpful, and nuanced information around blockchain uh, in healthcare in the sea of blog posts and articles articles online. Can you uh, walk us through quickly how you chose the topics that you included in the book, how you chose the authors and uh, how the final structure was in the end set up? Last year in 2018 at HIMSS, we launched another book called Blockchain Enabled Applications that was really a spin-off or an outgrowth of that health shares project with the National Science Foundation. And we saw that across multiple industries, we needed to have a book that was sort of a how-to guide and had credible use cases. And when HIMSS saw it, they said, we'd really like to have a book specific to the healthcare industry. And as we started to look at following a similar model of having some of the multiple voices and some of the best voices in the healthcare space that we're working on blockchain projects, and then also have a very human story element to that too with those use cases and um, examples that were real world, weren't just kind of theoretical. Uh, that was what we were looking for. Alex, you want to talk about how many authors there were and uh, kind of sure. the process we went through? Sure. We wanted it to, first of all, be very practical to speak to a, a variety of readers that anywhere from those who are, I would say, blockchain naive uh, and have not heard anything about it all the way to those who are uh, even part of the development that just simply want um, a more deep dive and overview of what is going on. Upon discussions, we felt really that using kind of the arrow of time, past, present, and future would be a, a good way to, to cater this heterogeneous uh, group of readers. What makes this book very unique in my opinion is that we don't we don't think of blockchain as this general purpose technology that makes things better faster cheaper but rather by by its impact on economic activity it really changes the way we interact with each other so it's kind of almost like a blockchain and and it'd be like and their uh, 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 technology. And, you know, at the end, as you see, we have five editors, 55 contributors with over 500 pages, which is quite an impressive feat for a first edition. David, you already mentioned that you also co-authored another book called uh, Blockchain Enabled Applications, and you've been in the space already um, between 2012 and 2015. That was when you started your first uh, blockchain project. So I think it's uh, really interesting to hear how you see the development of the space. The public became more aware of blockchain in 2017 and 2018. So where are we at the moment and uh, how do you see the development since 2012 in practice, going beyond just ideas? Yeah, well, it's been a wild ride and we tried to capture that in this book to, to uh, honor people who did some early work, even if that work was not as uh, uh, successful as they wanted it to be. Those lessons learned and their ability to contribute the real world aspects hopefully tempers some of what's been uh, a real market rush and kind of market exuberance too in the past uh, two years. If you look at things like the Gartner hype curve, there's one large bubble almost. Uh, it goes up a hill and then comes back down. I think we've come back down the hill with cryptocurrencies, but that's also where we start the climb on another hill, which is going to be even stronger and that's the hill of real value and real integration of some of these technologies. And it's oftentimes not for what people initially thought. Like in this case, it's not just cryptocurrencies and digital cash of the future, which I think is still going to be a strong play. But it's how it's going to affect all sorts of industries, in our case, including healthcare, and how it's going to speed up transactions, how it's going to improve transparency 
and trust within a system that frankly has a lot of room to improve trust too throughout uh, especially healthcare payments. We learned a lot from health shares. The first project we did too, we learned that the speed of the blockchain couldn't keep up with an electronic health record type of model at the time. Now, maybe even in the future, one could be successful there. But uh, during that time frame, uh, everything was still too slow and uh, wasn't going to work. Can you add a word or two about health shares that you mentioned twice uh, already? So uh, what was that project about specifically and where it is today? So uh, that project uh, taught us that we couldn't do electronic health records at the time. Now, this was a long time ago using blockchain uh, effectively, but that we could have uh, wellness records. And uh, that was what uh, some of our students that uh, were working on this project have continued to use and leverage in their other projects. I can't really comment on the projects they're doing right this second, except to say that it was an outgrowth of several different books, like the uh, Blockchain Enabled Applications book and this uh, Blockchain and Healthcare book. So that's been the uh, public outgrowth too. Um, some of the other people that were involved during that era have done quite well by being paid in uh, cryptocurrency for some of their early work while they were still students. Well, Bitcoin was still at, say, uh, $30 to $60 per coin, too. What I liked in the book is that we were able to also have um, a number of videos that we recorded. Over half the authors contributed video and audio. So we really got to hear their human stories of what their first uh, projects, their first successes, their first failures, and their first learnings from that, too. And we also hope that by having people tell their stories about blockchain and another emerging technology, blockchain and, te and telehealth, blockchain and electronic health records, blockchain and artificial intelligence or uh, medical tourism or blockchain and smart cities for some of the movements going on in Estonia or Dubai. If people tell their stories that way, then, uh, and tell it not just about blockchain itself, but about blockchain and these other emerging technologies, That's where I think some of the differentiation and maybe some of the power of that storytelling comes through in the book. I think it's interesting that you said that the first project basically that you did was in wellness and, and in EHR, also among the ICO projects uh, that uh, were on the market in the last few years, there was a lot of uh, hype around EHRs and blockchain, but in the book, uh, EHRs on the blockchain are in the future section. Maybe, Alex, can you comment a little bit on why did you put uh, this application there? Um, I would say that um, the day zero of a serious thinking about how to blockchainize, if you wish, healthcare was uh, during the ideation challenge that was sent out from the human and health services of the Obama administration towards mid end of 2016. There was a call for ideas to be sent to the federal government of where the best and the brightest minds think blockchain or distributed ledger technology could be helpful. When you look, there were anywhere between, I think, 55 to 75 submissions. At the end, there were 15 finalists three won some type of nominal recognition. But um, you saw that many of those ideas gravitated around the need um, for a better electronic health record. And the electronic health record industry, although it is many decades long, I think the top five companies would take about 80% of the electronic health record market, but we have hundreds of electronic health records out there, it really emphasizes how this digitization of the health information or the interface between patients to doctors, something that has been on our mind for a long, long time. However, the unintended consequences that came out from this digitization started to change the quality and the type of patient-physician dialogue. And to the point where both patients and doctors have been very dissatisfied with the current configuration of what electronic health records do or their impact 
And so that kind of caused really a, 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 uh, I would say, um, interest or an intent to tackle this as ambitious as this would be. And the feeling, you know, the reason why we put it in the future is really that feeling that even though many strides forward have happened in terms of our ability to procure more sophisticated data or integrate social determinants of health or help phenotyping better patients so that we can genotype them better, nonetheless, we have yet to see the positive impact that it has in restoring a peer-to-peer or direct interaction uh, between patients and physicians. And perhaps, you know, there'll be other technologies like voice assistance, better AI that fuels the insights that come out of the raw da- unstructured data. But definitely blockchain has a huge role into uh, 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 changing not only quality of the electronic um, uh, record, but also the sovereignty or the ownership. I thought it was really good when uh, one of the authors uh, in the book wrote that uh, technical challenges did not rank at the top of any respondent's list of what are the challenges in blockchain implementation. The, on the top of the list, there were change management, governance, consensus within consortia, resource allocation, and of course, also um, coding resources. Everyone can agree that uh, EHRs on the blockchain would be beneficial, but that's just uh, a tip of the iceberg. The whole infrastructure and everything that has to change to uh, enable that is what's beneath the surface. Yeah, that's a, a very astute point. If you look at the challenges in in blockchain as well as the the promise of blockchain, It's not just about the technology, and that's what we're seeing. It's about how it's going to change other business drivers, um, other stakeholder trust, validation. Those are some of the things that might take just as long or longer than the initial technical implementation, too. We tried to make sure we had multiple voices and uh, didn't just write a book for programmers, too, for this particular one, too, but that would be for business leaders, that would be for stakeholders, even that patients could uh, get ideas about how this may change their healthcare. If I may continue on, on, on sure. David's uh, remark, you know, this is really a, a culture change that needs to happen, not, by the way, not just in the U.S. market. You know, the U.S. healthcare market has its own particularities as any healthcare market. You know, we can't compare what's going on in the U.K. or in Switzerland or in uh, 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 Slovenia no more than what is going on in the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, stakeholder presence, size, and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, the amount of money that also uh, pertains to that uh, digital business, you know, coming back from the HIMS uh, meeting, you can appreciate how huge uh, health IT is within this uh, 14 trillion US, uh, seven to 11, depends how you count it, trillion worldwide in healthcare. But, uh, you know, using um, uh, David's uh, uh, um, example on the Gartner hype cycle. And um, I look at it from a human perspective that any change has what we call these five stages of grief to loss or to change. This was written by Kubler-Ross, who was a Swiss psychiatrist back in the 60s. And she basically described five stages that we go through when there is change or loss. Uh, um, from the moment it happens until acceptance and stage one is in denial, you know, and I don't think that we're there anymore. I think that now really in 2019, the general public recognizes that blockchain is a thing. It is permeated into the common language 
Stage two pertains to anger that, that follows loss or change, which might be a result of anxiety. And we do see anger that, 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 that pertains to behavior of different people within the blockchain or crypto market. And, uh, this, this creates some, uh, I would say, uh, negative coverage when you read the, the, the mass media that we're now emerging from in 2019. Then there is the stage three is bargaining, and hence this whole discussion of different technological features that can be put in, and we're kind of refining or maturing maturing our language. The fourth and last step before acceptance, which is stage five, is depression. There are folks who have been discouraged from the 2017-2018 uh, 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 happenings. But in essence, for those who stayed within the community and continue to build and socialize blockchain, we're actually very excited because we can feel that there is a more mature, accurate, and, and thoughtful description of what realistically uh, different blockchain-based solutions can or should do within the healthcare space. The book uh, was first presented at HIMSS 2019 conference in February. So going from where you just finished off, Alex, uh, what did the debate about around uh, blockchain look like this year compared to previous years? So in the last two years, the ICOs contributed to a broader understanding or interest for the blockchain. But... Uh, what did the participants talk about at HIMSS this year? How much more mature are the discussions? How much do they differ from, you know, just the general understanding of what the technology offers? Yeah, I'll, I'll also um, ask David to, to, to add his perspective, but I would say that the subset discussion of uh, um, using uh, digital money or cryptocurrencies as a alternative a way to raise capital or as a way to incentivize patients to modify their behavior uh, in order to maintain health by gaining some wealth, I think that that's not a discussion that people are having right now. We are still at this, at this point where most people are trying to figure out what, what is this blockchain thing that everybody's talking about. I can say that the conversation that is going on in the United States is very different than the conversation that's going on in other parts of the world in the sense that there are legal ramifications of uh, having or not having a ICO. And in the United States right now, ICOs are just not allowed. And there's a whole discussion about which federal authority, would it be the um, SEC, the Security and Exchange uh, Commission, or would it be the Commodity Federal Trade Committee Commission, or would it be the, uh, 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 you know, what is the taxation behind it? That we're still kind of, you know, figuring out what is a cryptocurrency, is it a currency? Is it an asset? How should it be taxed? So there's a very unsophisticated discussion that pertains into the healthcare sphere about what are the financial implications of ICOs and STOs. So it's kind of like you cannot talk about ICOs in the United States uh, in, uh, on itself. And it has to be part of, I would say, uh, um, a, a, a dual type of uh, uh, economy that involves also security token offerings. In Europe and in Asia and in Latin America, it's a, a little bit different because uh, 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 and actually Switzerland is a very good example of how FINMA, their regulatory body, came out with a very crisp and clear legal framework that has pushed different cantons or different states in Switzerland to come up with exact ruling of how to perform ICOs in Switzerland or in their jurisdiction. And there are countries like Malta and Gibraltar and, 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 and Estonia that, that are talking, uh, you know, about these things as well. So I think to, that so directly answer uh, your question is that at HIMS, there was little to no conversation because it's just premature. But in general, I think that um, we are going to emerge this year with a better 
and more um, sophisticated conversation of what is the role of financial gain or financial procurement in changing behavior and how can we um, transform patients from being passive healthcare consumers to active health and wealth producers. I saw a little different perspective. Um, Hims is a huge place, you know, with over 40,000 people and uh, some of the biggest companies and organizations in the world in healthcare all represented. And what I saw was some momentum, not for kind of the Wild West with the ICOs uh, or even the, uh, the STOs being talked about a lot, but people are trying to understand where blockchain is going to be strategic to their existing business or government regulation and processes and uh, the social aspects of, of healthcare, whether that be policy and regulation or whether that be um, ongoing care and payment. There were many pilots that were being started. So I'd say from that standpoint, we're still in the early days, but many of those large organizations are starting to take notice and starting to uh, set up their own pilots. We were able to talk in the book about a few of the first ones of those too. And I see even more unfolding. Even HIMSS themselves as an organization, the largest healthcare IT association in the world, was talking about the strategic value of blockchain to so many aspects of the back-end administration of healthcare and the verification and trust of transactions throughout the network. So I was interested to see that the number of sessions had increased this year, the um, placement and prominence of those sessions had increased, and that meant that the dialogue and conversations had gone to a new level this year too within those sessions. If we continue from this point, there's a lot going on around blockchain in the U.S., in healthcare specifically. So the Center for Disease Control is piloting projects for epidemics detection. Healthcare providers and insurance companies are connecting through pilot projects. Pharma companies from AbbVie, Genentech, Pfizer are dipping their toes in the space. So based on your knowledge, uh, based on your insider uh, overview, can you assess which projects are most far ahead at the moment, where are we going to see the first practical implications? Yeah, I'll give you a type of project rather than uh, something that may uh, you know change day to day to looking at some of the projects like uh, HHS Accelerate and some of the ones that uh, other governments are doing was interesting. Looking at um, some of the supply chain projects, as well as some of those projects that involved clinical trials, and maybe even, uh, I'll call it one chapter, uh, Sean Mannion's last chapter of the book that uh, from, from Science Distributed that really talked about the way that the whole blockchain movement could be used to verify scientific evidence across multiple fields, but particularly in healthcare and drug discovery and some of the areas of medicine that really it's life and death if we don't get that verification of the research findings, that's a place where I think blockchain holds huge promise in the future. There's some current trials underway in those areas. I would say, you know, blockchain means a, a lot of different things to different people. For some, blockchain simply means better and more secure data registries. For others, it means immutable records that can't be tampered. Uh, for some, it means an audit trail that can improve automatic adjudication. So each large institution, like you mentioned, the CDC or uh, IBM or Change Health with, with 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 their large partners, you know, they're all they're all looking at where blockchain can improve their daily operation. They are uh, putting some funding for the size of what these companies are. Um, it would be, in my opinion, marginal. But it's not, it's not zero. The way I look at it is that, um, currently, um, I don't see, uh, large in institutions really understanding on how blockchain can change the way we actually look at healthcare. And it could be part of because they still have 
some some uh, uh, more things to learn about. Uh, perhaps they're a bit more skeptical. Perhaps they're a bit more reticent in view of the legal or regulatory landscape. Or perhaps they have an invested uh, interest to maintain uh, centralized uh, structures. But I don't think right now in 2019 institutionally, even though there is an, a, a beginning of a movement or an awakening, there is really a, an embracing of uh, the true potential of the advantages that decentralized economies and peer-to-peer -peer transactions uh, offer. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of JP Morgan coming out with their own cryptocurrency that when you start to look exactly what they're doing, it's, it's, it's not a, a, the way we think of a cryptocurrency. So it might be that there is a smart contract in there, or it might be that there is some cryptographic technology that, 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 that they've taken upon and some protocol that they're utilizing. But the way they're approaching it, does not fundamentally change the way they interact within or with other stakeholders. We are still years away from uh, large institutions really seeing what we see as advantages of a uh, more radical market that exists than the one that is right now. If we try to be a little bit more specific, uh, Alex, you have a background in pain management. You uh, are an MD. Can you describe the potential of blockchain to better manage the opioid crisis and the existing efforts to support this aim? There's uh, a chapter on that in the book as well. Sure, sure. For, for almost, uh, what, 20 26, 27 years, I've treated uh, patients with, with pain, uh, not, not only in the U.S., but also in Israel and in Switzerland. And I've really learned to understand that um, pain patients are basically the result of inability of the or the limits of the healthcare system to provide relief to these specific patients. So, so I've never seen a patient that came to me, you know, smiling or in a good mood. These are all, so to speak, the failures of treatment that we would be like the specialist of specialists after they've seen surgeons, after they've seen neurologists, rheumatologists, uh, 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 psychiatrists, and so on. When you see these type of patients who all have extremely negative, negative medical histories, that are not only negative because of the pain and the suffering itself, but all the, I would say, unnecessary suffering that is added because of the inefficiencies within the system. These, these patients really live to the fullest extent of how unhelpful the modern healthcare system uh, is. This, of course, pushed me for, for decades to think about how can we redesign healthcare in a way that has less of this friction. And I always say that pain is mandatory, but it's the suffering that's optional. Uh, obviously, what types of treatments can you do for chronic non-cancer pain is a topic for another interview. But what all what pertains to this this friction and lack of coordination and lack of common purpose and lack of common data that can fuel the whole process, this is what pertains to this whole blockchain, I would say, initiative, is to really try to improve the, 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 the fluidity or the interoperability or the uh, safety of this information. And at the end, it's really all about self-sovereignty. It's all about patients owning their information in the truest sense of ownership, a medical ownership, technological ownership, but also a financial ownership of that. And I think that that's, that's where we need to kind of push ourselves to think that health data is like money. And I'm not saying that we need to monetize it. I'm saying that it's like money. In other words, it's yours. It's personal. It's yours. It belongs to you. 
it needs to be kept safely in a wallet that you can access whenever you want, wherever you want, for whatever reason. And if that really is treated as money, as an asset, then you can expect that its value will accrue with time. You can invest in it. You can create more of it by investing in your health. And then afterwards, you can inherit it or you can, you know, donate it. And right now, this is not at all how we look at, at data and how these large institutions that you mentioned earlier, we speak a lot about security, we speak a lot about privacy, but what we really don't speak about, and that's where I think the main discussion should be, is the self-sovereignty piece. That, I think, is an important point, but I think John Bass wrote in the book that in many ways, today's healthcare enterprises compete with the very patients they serve. And instead of focusing on patient outcomes, the traditional system focuses more on billing, narrowing choice, shifting cost, creating leverage, maximizing reimbursement and retaining patients. I think uh, ICOs and the whole idea about the tokenization of patient data um, cut into this whole debate how the healthcare system uh, is going to change. But uh, now that the ICOs have kind of quieted down, the question is, what is going to be the, the real incentive for blockchain to change healthcare? Because the uh, opportunities for transparency and cost saving and optimizations might not be um, in the interest of the current players. If we just look at the pharma industry, it's ways of working was often um, very far away from, from transparency uh, until there's a scandal. I would say that I do, I do not recall uh, reading in, uh, you know, that the 11th commandment says, um, you know, uh, thou shall not treat your, 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 your patients honestly, or, uh, you know, thou shall use their data for your own benefit alone. If we really want to talk about business drivers, if we really, really want to talk about the capitalism that is behind the healthcare system, uh, Smithian capitalism, or what Adam Smith spoke about, was really about that these large centralized organizations reinvest their money into their enterprise, and they don't they don't hoard it for the sake of hoarding. Now, what that means is that it's all about economic design. Now, this is not to say that uh, this can be changed uh, tomorrow or that uh, stated invested uh, uh, interest will be just dropped in a hat. If you if we specifically we speak about pharma, they understand that their current business model, okay, is not sustainable. The law of diminished returns, you can see that in order for them to keep an internal revenue rate, an IRR that is increasing all the time, uh, they have to ramp up the prices of their drugs into, you know, uh, 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 under the premise that that's part of their research and development. But these drugs are starting to become so expensive that no one can have access to them. And so in a spending market, you cannot have things that are so out of access that people can't purchase them. So even they understand that this way of, of doing things is not sustainable. And the fact that few individuals can sit in, in some room behind the scenes and define everything for everyone, that's not a sustainable model as well. And so I think that what blockchain brings to the field is a liberation of that market of turning from a free market and really to an open market that includes everyone. And that by redesigning the incentives behind it, by redesigning the, 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 the payment schemes that you actually can gain wealth by remaining healthy and not just in an abstract way, but actually get money or income from it, that is the beginning of, of, of a movement of creating a more participatory open economy.
economic um, patient incentives could be very interesting in promoting patient outcomes and ones that the patient takes some role in or more role in too. So I'm, uh, I'm encouraged by that too. I look at this at a macro level and say, this is the same argument that we've had with multiple disruptions throughout history as we look at the new kind of superpowers of the first generation web, the ability to take one thing and make an infinite number of digital copies of that. That certainly disrupted publishing, music industry, uh, even videos to this day. And the web 2.0 certainly disrupted our um, the ability for people to control the narrative for news and um, the ability for trust and social to uh, come on board um, and kind of have the superpower of connecting people across the globe and making content distribution easy for in the individual, not just the organization. This Web 3.0 is sort of that reestablishment of trust. And that's where blockchain, smart contracts, and other technologies are going to play a key role. And I really feel like it's such a large scale movement and disruption, if you will, that the incumbents aren't going to be able to resist forever. Now, certainly there will be moves to make sure that uh, those incumbent systems are self-healing and uh, continue to move and operate in their direction. But um, you've seen that disruptions in the past, like the ones I mentioned, have been so strong that the traditional players and incumbents in those spaces really can't overcome them. This would be a first if, uh, if healthcare is able to withstand that uh, global onslaught of the disruptive change that's coming. Uh, in my humble opinion, I think that uh, regulation is going to have to uh, play a huge part in this change because um, blockchain is a great tool, but it is just a tool. So if we just look at how, uh, for example, drug prices are regulated uh, in the US compared to, to Europe, um, a recent New York Times report just mentioned that a vial of insulin that costed $200 a decade ago now sells for close to $1,500 or another drug, uh, Act Immune, uh, that treats malignant osteoporosis and sells for uh, less than $350 for one month supply in the, in Britain costs 26,000 uh, US dollars for a one month supply in the United States. So, that's what I'm trying to say. I mean, we can we can achieve transparency and we can know about uh, these kind of situations. But until regulation really uh, steps forward to to change the availability and how the system uh, runs, uh, no tool can help. Yeah, it's going to take public private partnership. And part of what we tried to highlight in the book we were so glad to have the examples from DHHS here, too, of some of their initiatives and other governments that are embracing this and working with their citizenry, like uh, in Estonia, that could bring about some of that transparency and also create that regulatory climate or, where needed, that regulatory change to enable some of, of these uh, areas. That is going to be that's going to be some of the battlegrounds in the future, I'm sure, the current battlegrounds in the future. But I yeah, do I, think I, that uh, that will prevail in uh, you know free and democratic societies. I don't disagree with um, the predatory practices that um, are currently uh, happening in the United States and specifically in the field of drug pricing. Um, but I, I am uh, more a believer of um, market forces than um, central planning uh, when you talk about regulators by some magic way are going to find the right grounds that are both ethical and moral and business-wise to, to create a marketplace which will make things accessible. Uh, at least in the last 50 years, have shown us that this is not, at least in the United States. In Europe, it might be a little bit more different, that people maybe are more amenable for for this kind of central planning uh, paradigm. Um, so, so what is happening, however, in the United States are two things. One is this immense power of innovation, 
You know, when you walk through the hymns conference that, uh, like, like, like David said, 40, I think it was as close to 50,000 people this year with over 1500 vendors. When you look at the amount of energy that, that really trillion dollars worth of business is put into with the sole interest of improving human life, it's an impressive force. And the combination of the huge technology with understanding the non-sustainability of certain practices. If people cannot afford these drugs and they will continue to die, mortality has increased in the United States. Life expectancy has become shorter in the last three years. We will reach to a tipping point where there will be a change in the, 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 the rules of engagement. So I think that instead of thinking of disintermediation that we've heard a lot in the blockchain space where blockchain will disintermediate all these things, you know, I think we should talk about reintermediation. How do we repurpose middle people or, or, or middle stakeholders that have proven to be less valuable? than what they've been designed to be or the, what they used to be. Well, we should stop talking about competition and understand that in a digital market, we should talk about co optition In other words, collaborative competition. That there's no one company that can do A to Z. And so maybe we create an ecosystem or a community of three, four, five companies that move together in order to create something that has more value than what just one company does, then they do everything. I think these are the things that are going to really happen in, in, in reality, in, in actual practice, these next years to come, than rather hoping that from Washington, you know, Congress suddenly there's going to be a meeting of the minds where they're going to say, oh, yes, let's have one payer or let's have, you know, One decision that is okay for everyone in regard to drug pricing or whatnot. It will be the market forces and the non-sustainability or non-resilient designs to the digital market that is developing. That's a nice prediction of where things are going. And this is what I was uh, hoping to address in the last question. David, uh, what do you think? uh, What are your predictions around blockchain in healthcare in the next two to five years? Well, I try not to make too many predictions, but if you look at some of the evidence from our really smart contributors, I think that this trend of blockchain and other emerging technologies creating new solutions to some of the problems we've talked about today um, is going to continue to accelerate. And if you look at the investment from major institutions, major companies, governments, as well as the entrepreneurial ecosystem that's growing so rapidly, we're going to continue to see these integrations that are exciting and challenging to the status quo, as we talked about. My hope is that we don't have a massive breach of trust in the health space around blockchain that sets us back uh, as a whole industry. That's my hope and one of my fears for the future. But I think that with a lot of smart people who are very conscientious and working on that too, that we can look towards the promising elements of that too. So I'm uh, really excited about some of the things in the book around blockchain and artificial intelligence and blockchain and privacy and security. Um, I do think that that will help, uh, along with good uh, regulatory climates, will help us solve some real social problems and maybe even put some of the, the power back in the hands of the patient too and democratize healthcare a little bit as well too. Those are things that I hope for the future. I won't say they're predictions, but they're my hopes for the future. This was the 33rd episode of Faces of Digital Health. Stay tuned, subscribe to the podcast, share this or other episodes with your network or leave a rating or a review in iTunes. Any thoughts are always highly appreciated.